Facebook got the notification. All right. We should be live. But as always, um, we require some kind of external validation to know that we actually exist. So someone is going to have to tell us whether or not we actually exist. Hey, someone's saying that we exist. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to take that as as legit. Hey, everybody. Fraser here. Uh, this week, I'm joined by George Dvorsky. Did I say that right? Is that perfect. Right? Perfect. Uh, perfect. Fellow Canadian, proud uh, Toronto Maple Leaf fan and uh, science writer for Gizmodo. Editor, what are, what's your official position? Uh, senior staff reporter right now. Senior That's staff reporter. Incarnation. Yeah. Senior staff reporter for Gizmodo. Uh, primary, you know, you cover a lot of science stuff definitely cover a lot of the space stuff and in your former life you uh were quite the futurist and uh transhumanist so my hope is that we can kind of cover all of the things uh, people always give me a hard time if i don't sort of say who is joining me george how's it going good thank you for having me i'm excited to speak to you um, I haven't had much of an opportunity to do so. I've been uh, a follower of your work for, I can't remember how long. Universe Today is, mm -hmm. uh, been, it's been on my uh, RSS feed since the very beginning, and it still is to this very day. So uh, uh, thank you. It's a privilege to be able to speak to you today and uh, to reach out to your audience. To your, yeah, I, I your we just people. crossed 20 years. So Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's crazy. Wow. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and, and same for you. I mean, this is going to be one of those sort of, uh, you know, we're going to say nice things about each other for a second here. Everyone's just going to have to put up with this. Uh, but yeah, I really, you came on to my radar and I've, I've got a, a, you know, man, like, I don't know, eight years ago, close to 10 years ago, you had done an article and I feel, I was it for Wired? I'm trying to remember, but essentially how to dismantle Mercury and build a Dyson sphere in five easy steps and can you and i think a lot of people like yeah. like i think a lot of people are sort of familiar with you know my work isaac arthur's work um uh, john michael godier there's a bunch of people who are sort of d tackling various topics of of advanced civilizations various kardashev civilizations and i think that that you definitely influenced a lot of our thinking in in these matters. So so can you sort of take us back to sort of yeah, that was, where did you uh, that, get into that, that? That initially was a post uh, at my blog, Sentient Developments, yep. which uh, that started back in 2002, I believe. And uh, that I blogged at that, at that site for the longest time. It was, uh, and uh, Annalie knew it's from I9 picked up on that particular post and she right. asked to uh, kind of, uh, republish it at io9 and that was actually the first post that i ever had i believe uh in featured in full at io9 and, and i would say that that, that relationship with annalee knew it's uh evolved and to the point where i ended up becoming a, a permanent staff writer there at io9 and our the science crew that we had there eventually morphed with the science crew at gizmodo as they were under the same umbrella organization and now we're one big happy family uh at gizmodo but yeah that was uh uh, as I'm sure many of your, uh, as your listeners and viewers are aware, the, uh, the whole Dyson sphere concept is, is so fantastic, but it's, it also makes so much sense when you think about it. I mean, you think about where, where, you know, a civilization is going to end up, uh, in, in the reasonable far future, but not crazy, crazy far future in terms of, you know, the sun emits just so much energy that it's just so, so much waste in space. And if we kind of extrapolate further in terms of, uh, the tremendous energy demands that would uh, uh, be uh, required by an like a super advanced civilization. It only would only make sense that we tap into the most natural, the most accessible resource there is, which is that giant ball of fire at the at the, at the center of the solar system. And yes, yeah, so this idea uh, that Dyson came up with that we we covered with gigantic ball uh, or shell, if you will, of, of solar panels, and so that virtually no energy is wasted from the sun. And that and like you mentioned. Uh, aptly that that would therefore we would graduate at that point to a um a kardashev scale two, two. civilization yeah which means that we've effectively uh 
uh, grab all the available energy that our solar system has to offer. So as I'm not entirely sure, because obviously the irradiation is being emitted from Jupiter and, and Saturn and so on, but, but we can we can build Dyson spheres around them as well, should we want to. And I believe that's also been proposed by some thinkers. But yeah, I mean, um, the, I think the, I think there's a hurdle in terms of thinking, well, how could we possibly build such a, a horrendous, you know, mega scale project like that? And what was fun about the, uh, the how to build a Dyson sphere is five easy steps. Well, it's not that easy. Can we, we're not going to build it next, next week, for example. But it sort of broke it down into steps where you kind of like thought about it. Like, yeah, geez, you know, that's actually not the craziest thing I ever heard of. So the idea here was that, you know, you just start small and you just work your way big and, we wouldn't require you know human workers in space to build it. We would need a sufficient uh, level of uh, robotic power and obviously artificial intelligence. But where you have these bots just working autonomous, just slowly building, building, building until this shell just gets larger, larger, larger. It's not going to be overnight. But the fact of the matter is, is that once you have a sizable solar array, functional in space and already collecting energy for you, then that's going to start to power uh, you know the rest of the project. So the, the most difficult part will be getting started. But once you reach a certain critical mass, then boom, this thing's just gonna start to build and build and build as, as you get these robots that are probably working on, on models of self-replication, self-repair. And uh, as we were discussing earlier today, really what is perhaps the biggest burden to completion at this point is not even necessarily the, the technology and the, and the robotics that's, and the AI to build it, but it becomes an issue of material. Is where in the where do you get all the stuff that's required to continue to build what would be? And I forget, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Uh, I believe like thinkers like um, Andrew Sandberg and others have actually crunched the numbers to show how much mass is required, how much how big this shell would be. Um, and some uh, thinkers have proposed this is not my idea, but other thinkers have proposed that well, we just start to, you know, there's a lot of inert matter in the solar system in the form of some dead planets, particularly those in the inner solar system. Why don't we just dis literally dismantle Mercury, uh, possibly Venus, and certainly take a lot of the, the junk that's just floating around doing nothing uh, in the asteroid belt, which, by the way, I, I recently learned is not a whole lot. No, of stuff. no. If you, if you take all of the mass of the entire asteroid belt, you end up with about 5% the mass of the moon. So it is not that, very oh, much. Oh, wow. That's even less than I thought. That yeah. is not a lot of stuff No, it's there. not a lot of stuff. But Mercury is, is fine. And I think, you know, I think it's important that, you know, it's not a sphere. It is a swarm. You are not building a rigid sphere. You are uh, you're building a, a, a bunch of solar panels step by step. And it, I, I always like to joke that we've actually already begun our Dyson Swarm. When you look at the spacecraft that we already have in space – collecting solar power and doing science on various spacecraft that is the beginning of our dyson swarm it's 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 already yeah. started i agree with you i I thought of it in similar terms and um yeah i i, I the, the i do have some obviously some logistical concerns or practical concerns and once we start to fuss with the uh, uh the amount of matter that is spinning around uh the uh the solar system that you could mess with the orbital harmony that, that currently exists amongst the planets. So uh, we would have to do some serious number crunching before we get into such a project to make sure that we wouldn't create this kind of domino effect where suddenly all the planets are entering into what the, the planets that we want to remain start to assume these rather chaotic uh, orbits that could actually even potentially lead to collisions many hundreds, thousands, millions of years down the line, that, that sort of a thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I do also tend to think that we are in the early uh, stages, if you will, of this, the, the Dysonification, if you will, of, uh, of human civilization, just in terms of how many, uh, uh, in terms of the revolution that we're having right now in terms of the solar panels and solar arrays, where we are, we are increasingly covering more land mass on our planet with arrays that are capable of harvesting energy. And that's only going to, I mean, because like I said earlier, we just we cannot afford to waste all this free energy that we're getting from the sun that's currently being so uh, terribly wasted. And uh, not to suggest that we'll have like a Cybertron sort of a situation, but I do envision the day where the earth, a good portion of the earth is covered with, uh, or at least and all the deserts, any, anywhere where the land is not really usable or we don't really uh, need it, or we're not obviously infringing upon uh, wildlife and, and the a balance of ecosystems. But to a reasonable degree, we will, I think, not waste any space on the planet. But more so, well, why do it on planet when we can do it off planet? And this is another, 
I'm sure you've heard of these like, the, the space, uh, space based solar uh, uh, array uh, uh, ideas where we, heart, we, de we definitely build these arrays in space and beam the energy back down to uh, receiving stations on Earth. Uh, I know the Japanese are uh, very much working on projects like this. Their space agency has a project in the works. They're not building it, they're still just thinking about how to make it happen. And you can understand why Japan would be interested in such a thing. They've been, yeah. uh, they're a bit gun shy when it comes to nuclear and uh, other forms of energy, yet they've got a, they've, they're the, again this advanced kind of a civilization among, uh, in terms of their technologies, and they, yet they, they have the tremendous need for energy and they want to be self sufficient that way. There was and one. Uh, there was one thing that I still I'm trying to get to the bottom and have somebody actually do the math for me on this. Is will beaming energy back to Earth increase the overall sort of thermal load of the planet because you are going to be taking m megawatts, gigawatts of solar radiation? You're going to be beaming it down to Earth in in the form of say. Um, uh, I don't know, like microwaves, and then yeah, you're going to be turning it, it into things, and they're going to be pushing out waste heat, and that's going to go into the atmosphere. So I wonder if, in fact, in the long term, it actually, that won't work. It's like the next global warming. But now we're like, yeah. you know. I hadn't even thought of that, and uh, uh, that's ob obviously something that's, you know, worthy of uh, further scrutiny, because we, I would hate for us to you know, make things even worse than they are today. Yeah, so it feels to me like, in fact, like, like I think people are going to go like, oh, space-based power is the way, but then people are going to realize, oh, actually, if we put too much space-based power, we're just going to heat up the planet, and that's a, that, so back to yeah. the same problem. So I think that, yeah. you know, a lot of people ask me, like, why do we want to go to space and and i really like jeff bezos's rationale for this which is that we want to go to space because we want to make earth a better place we want to get all the pollution all the power generation all of the manufacturing mining all that stuff and just get it off the planet and get it out into space and so i'll bet the power of the dyson sphere or this dyson swarm will be used in space to to manufacture and all that kind of stuff and and earth will just Ideally, if it still is around, if it hasn't gotten dismantled too, um, will be the will be the place. <laughs> will, Earth right. can do the one thing that it's great at, which is to be a great place for life, a great place to live. Agreed. And the yeah, rest and... of the universe can just can just be our you know unless we find life anywhere else, but the rest of the universe can just be our our uh, manufacturing facility. And and you and you bring up a really good point, which is more of a question, which is, well, why would we? Why are we doing this? Why, like you said, why go to why go to space? Uh, why build a Dyson sphere? Why, why become a, a stage two Kardashian civilization? Uh, like, isn't enough? Uh, isn't enough enough? You know, so to speak. But again, there, there's a, there's maybe this inexorable law of technological development. It's kind of like filling up your hard drive. No matter how big your hard drive is. Uh, you're you're going to end up just filling it up. I think civilizations are the same way. They're just going to keep advancing until they can't possibly advance anymore, or they just destroy themselves first. And one can argue, and this goes back to kind of this transhumanist uh, thinking, uh, the tra transhumanist being again this, uh, this just this general idea that uh, human evolution has kind of got us to this particular point uh, uh, today in terms of what our bodies are like, what our brains are like, and that now our, our technologies are such that we can now kind of take over from Darwinian processes and start to uh, re-engineer ourselves, re like talk about life extension, uh, aug intelligence augmentation, changing the way our bodies work. But there might be a, a general, uh, there might be a general um, evolution towards losing our biological nature. So kind of the cyborg, cyborgification of humanity, or even these, these kind of like, um, really kind of like science fiction ideas where we would upload ourselves and become completely digital non-corporeal beings uh, clearly if we're going to do something like that and again I'm, this is all very speculative if we are going to do something like that we're going to need a lot of computers we're going to need tremendous amounts of computation because we can't even begin to imagine therefore what as digital beings the kinds of computation we would need to create the kinds of environments the workspaces the recreation we want to, the scientific experiments that we want to conduct the simulations within simulations within simulations yeah like, all know, those ancestor you know, simulations the, these, these matryoshka dolls of you know uh of, of everything again again i just feel that we'll never have enough so yeah we're going to build a dyson sphere so that we will have enough and we can kind of progress to that uh that stage two of uh of kardashian uh, lifestyle that we can i'm not i'm not necessarily a believer in kardashian three uh i don't know if that exists uh 
we that the jury's still open on that. Certainly, our galaxy is clearly not does not host a Kardashian right. three because uh, we don't see signs of aliens extracting the com- all the energy from the Milky Way. It's clearly not happening. We can see all the stars at, at night. They're not all obscured by um, their own you know Dyson spheres. Um, but we don't know, for example, what might be happening in other galaxies. But again, I, I from what we see it out there in the cosmos, it, it doesn't appear that mm-hmm. Kardashian three is a thing. Yeah, we um, don't see any evidence of like it would. There would be a telltale infrared signature from a galaxy absolutely. that's been entirely surrounded by Dyson swarms. We would see that, and we don't. And so to the best of our ability right now, we don't see any type three civilizations and it, you know, you having dismantled mercury. So I would be interested to know why you think that it isn't going to happen or it isn't possible. Like, is it, I mean, are we alone or, I mean, is it, are we alone or is it just that it's impossible? Because it doesn't feel like it's impossible. No, it's an upsetting question, right? Like, yeah. why isn't, why don't we see it? I'm going to get back to Fermi paradox and the great silence. And the, these are questions that have that troubled me that, you know, kind of troubled me very, very severely. Um, there's a number of ways you can maybe answer the question. And uh, perhaps most optimistically, uh, it, it's that maybe being a Kardashian 2 is enough. That, that That's kind of a, a good end state. And I'm a believer in what's called adaptationism, is that, so it may be, we may be required in some future post-human state to agree upon a mode of being that, that guarantees our well-being and, and just as importantly, our ongoing survival. And that to deviate from that adaptation would be catastrophic. So that might be just, okay, we're settled now as a, as a type two, let's park it here, good enough. Because even in that mode, we could uh, pursue what's called the hedonistic imperative, which is this idea that we kind of create our own version of heaven. Uh, again, almost every civilization since the beginning of time has had this, uh, this, 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 this mythology, if you will, of, of, of what it means to be in the afterlife, or what it means to transcend you know, this current state of being. And I think only in the last couple of hundred years, maybe we've lost touch with that sensibility and that urge. I mean, maybe through some utopian political thinking that still exists, but certainly I'm thinking more existentially, more even spiritually for the lack of a better term. I, I think that, that to create these ultimate modes of, of bliss and happiness and, and sense of well-being would be in a, in a way the most ultimate end state, the most ultimate manifestation of where civilization could head. I think this kind of Star Trek vision of, of just going into spaceships and traveling and exploring just for the sake of it and conquering just for the sake of it and just continuing to just grow in this sense i'm I'm not sure i buy it Uh, also uh, you and i love space obviously but to a certain degree we're we're seeing that it's a bit of an information desert there's only there's only there's almost nothing we can't analyze even from earth in a way Mm -hmm. we're getting once we get some more powerful telescopes up there we might even send some interstellar probes out there like i mean this is nothing i'm not rambling now but like I would like to even just talk to you about the fact that we have potentially interstellar, what is it, three potential interstellar probes in the making right now uh, that are uh, in, the, in terms of the two Voyager probes and the uh, and the uh, Well, the New Pioneers Horizons. and New Horizons. So got oh, five. and the Pioneers. Yeah. Oh, there's five. Yeah. Right. Unintentional, yeah. in a way, uh, interstellar. And they're not interstellar yet. It's going to take quite a while still to, to be in that space in between, you will, of yep. solar systems. But um, yeah, back to what I'm saying is uh, maybe Kardashev 2 is good enough. That's where civilizations ultimately uh, uh, stay. The that, problem with that theory. That seems ridiculous to me, right? Like if you just graph yeah. the demand for power all the way back to the beginning of life itself, there is a continuous growing exponential power curve that continues on through life forms into multicellular organisms, in through. Uh, primitive man all the way through our entire civilization like it seems why like we don't know what we'll use that power for but we we will want to use that power and we'll always invent new reasons to use that power yeah this assumes that we will have uh control over our our destiny uh like after the robot apocalypse yeah then we could have an artificial they'll want to use the power well, they though, and, and, and we don't, we can't even presume to know what an artificial superintelligence would do in terms of uh, managing the, its post-human, um, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, I guess, parents, with, for lack of a better back of a better phrase, that the, the ones who brought it into existence. Um, and it may just kind of uh, force us to, to live in such a modality. Again, I'm just, I'm not trying to, I'm maybe trying to play devil's advocate a little bit, but uh, your point is well taken in that, it, I, again, it, it's, it, I just presented one possible theory. Uh, you're saying maybe you don't necessarily buy it. So for sure, if, if the trouble though, it gets back to Fermi paradox is if civilizations are able to break out of this uh, isolationist, in a way, even a xenophobic mode by staying at home in their home system. Then why do again the back to the Fermi product? Well, then why haven't we seen it? Yeah, where are they? And the Fermi, the where are they question again? Just as a complete you know, huge uh, overview of the Fermi paradox, the Fermi paradox is this uh, seemingly counterintuitive observation that uh, there's been plenty of time in the Milky Way's history uh, such that civilizations could have travel to every corner of the Milky Way several times over by now. And if, that might sound ridiculous to some of your listeners, but if you, if you actually look at the numbers, and even if you talk about one-tenth the speed of light and yeah. one-hundredth the speed of light, it still adds up. A lot of people have done this to figure out, yeah, it, 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 it could have happened. Because one of the most, the, the, the number one argument you get against why haven't we met aliens is like, oh, space is, the galaxy is too big. Space mm -hmm. is, is too big. It's like, no, this is the whole, the, 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 the central the crux of the Fermi products is that no, it's not too big. It's not too big in the context of how bloody old the Milky Way yeah. is. Well, and not only that, right? Like an asteroid made the trip. So, yes. Oh my God. Right. Absolutely. So, yes. so you know, if an asteroid can make the trip, then you would figure a um, some kind of clever robotic spacecraft yes. that is dismantling an asteroid as it goes could make the yes. trip as well. So I and like we know. just said, we just admitted that we even have five of our own devices right now that yeah. are hurtling you know, out, out into the cosmos, right? In fact, I so, think someone did the estimate that there's something like uh, 30,000 interstellar objects in the in the sil the larger solar system out to about a radius of about two yeah. light years at all times. Wow. So there wow. are there are space rocks making the journey from star to star all the time. Yeah. And, and you've got Thinkers like Harvard's uh, A.V. Loeb, who speculates that even some of these rocks might be co-opted by civilizations and converted into spacecraft. Right. Well, that's what I'm cool. saying. You know, you take one of these, right. you know, you send one of your, you know, you pull one of your mercury dismantling probes off of its uh, mercury job and you latch it onto one of these inter interstellar asteroids and have it make the journey to another star system dismantling the asteroid as it goes making more copies of itself and then they jump off when they need to to go to other places so yeah, yeah. here we are in the and, and again just back to the Fermi paradox what we also have to realize is that we're 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 extreme latecomers to the show here um the amount of time that has elapsed prior to earth forming and a, a civilization like ours emerging is is massive uh, so again, the Fermi paradox is not immediately easy thing to dismiss as to why the galaxy is not either at a Kardashev three scale or why we don't have obvious signs that aliens have been here. And that's another thing that, that's lost in a lot of people who are eager to dismiss the Fermi paradox is like, oh, they came and then they went. And it's like, no, they would not, they don't just come and go. If they come here, they stay here. They, 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 they will do they will take what, what they need from the solar system and, and reconstitute it, morph it, twist it contort it, create it into a something that's usable for them. Um, I, I just can't see a civilization just coming here for quote unquote scientific purposes uh, and this whole great, this whole like, again, Star Trek notion of prime directive and nonsense like that. Again, another thing, anytime, anytime you come up with a theory that discounts the Fermi paradox, again, a, again, a hugely common one is the zoo hypothesis where that, mm -hmm. or that, that they're there, they just put us in a zoo to observe us from a distance and so on. It's like, okay, that's absolutely a possibility. But the problem with, with this and so many other theories is that this has to assume therefore that every single extraterrestrial civilization that has ever popped up into existence in the Milky Way has agreed to the same policy, to the same set of rules, the same philosophy on how to treat other extraterrestrial civilizations. And um, I don't know how could that possibly, you know, how could, how could there be like a, a code of conduct mm -hmm. that everybody would agree by? Why yeah. is there, is there All it one takes is one break, break alien to go i'm just gonna let them know i'm gonna go and and tell them that it's not true or you know we're gonna disagree no it would require a level of agreement that is incomprehensible to to right. that wouldn't happen in our current you know 
obviously for humanity, and we don't want to anthropomorphize them, but still. Um, yeah, no, anybody, I mean, anybody who thinks they understand the Fermi paradox, I think they've solved it, uh, hasn't thought enough about the Fermi paradox. And, yeah, and, so. and for me, uh, you know, I lean towards we're the first intelligent yeah. civilization in the observable universe. That's my that's my leaning, right. um, because I don't want to think about the consequences of the great filter. Yeah. So I'm just going to oh, go yeah. with the former because I don't want to admit and the latter. I like that because there's also an, an adjunct theory that can work in in harmony with that, which is not only we're not we're not necessarily the first. Uh, we can say that we are amongst the first. So there's this idea that developmentally, and again, we would have to have some physicists actually provide us and some cosmologists provide us with a reason for this that only now in the milky way's history we're living at a very special time where intelligence like ours actually can emerge again i, I don't know what but why that would be i don't know why it would be now but it'd be nice to, if we could find like a theory x is like oh because there, this i mean i can't even make things up because i don't even know what, what would preclude you know intelligence from existing prior to let's say uh, this particular state we're about we're about yeah we're about halfway through well, we're halfway through the life cycle of our sun. And our sun, again, is a relative latecomer to the, to the Milky Way, I believe. Anyways, but it's, a, it's a, a pleasant thought to think that maybe that there are, like ourselves, all these little bop, 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 bubbles of, of intelligence is emerging at this relatively, the, relatively the same time in the Milky Way and that we are going to expand outward at, at a relatively the same time at a relatively same, uh, same pace. And like it's kind of like Ray Kurzweil vision are bubbles of, uh, expanding singularities will will meet and we'll do meet and greets and we'll just continue to just grow and grow and grow until we en envelop the entire um, Milky Way galaxy. Again, uh, I don't know if I believe this, but um, that's a that's a stretch. Yeah. But again, this is the problem that the Fermi uh, paradox forces you into is you got to come up with some pretty crazy theories to explain it away. So, and, uh, so how has um, being a like science journalist and now that you've been doing this full time now for for several years how has that changed your perspective as being a transhumanist so uh it's a great question and i would say uh one it has certainly made me much more critical of what has what can be an often insular looking and even a uh wishful thinking, you know, optimism of the transhumanist that when you, you know, I cover science paper after science paper after science paper, and I have to look at it as a journalist, I've looked at it through critical lenses and, um, uh, you know, point out some of the, maybe the limitations and, you know, you see how long it'll take something to, to actually come to fruition. So it's maybe a more critical thinker, I would say, for sure, more skeptical, even, I would say. At the same time, however, being, being like on top of this news on a daily basis, I see very little, and, I'll, and not to contradict what I just said about being skeptical, I see very little that makes me upturn my, my former kind of like ideas as to where we're headed as a species and where we're headed as a civilization. And I'll give you a good example. Well, many, I can give you many examples. Mm -hmm. Like just look, I mean, we've, we're like 15 years ago when I first became involved with this community, we were talking about, of course, genetic modifications. Uh, to human to humans and, and, and human enhancement and giving ourselves these new capacities that you know we, we would not have through nat through natural processes, and of course we didn't know how we were going to do. It. We just figured some voodoo in the future will, will will make it happen, and that voodoo now happens to be the CRISPR Cas9 editing system or any kind of CRISPR system that that, that right. works. And sure enough, late last year I'm reporting on the very first uh, human uh, genetically mod the first genetically modified humans to come into existence. Sadly, it's through un unbelievably controversial circumstances where a Chinese scientist uh, did this unilaterally and um, and, and uh, even potentially legal illegally, uh, and now we'll be facing the consequences back home in China. The scientist's name is He Zhangkui. But um, that sad aspect of this story, notwithstanding, what he did was was at least if, if what he's claiming is true. What he did was he used the CRISPR system to create uh, genetically modified twins that have a natural immunity to the HIV uh, virus, and that's that that's actually in my books an enhancement because that's not something that a, that a human would normally be born with. It's a, an extreme a small minority of humans are born with that, but for the most part, that's not what you would consider normal human functioning. 
uh, is by definition a kind of an enhancement. Although as transhumanists and, and a lot of bioethicists would argue, there's no distinction between enhancement and therapies when it comes to stuff like this. That, for example, I don't think any of us here would consider vaccinations to be an enhancement. We consider that that to be an indelible part of human functioning. And aside from a, whack, a wacky minority who's ruining things for everybody else right now. Yeah, get your um, vaccinations, well, everybody. Yeah, get your vaccinations. For the most part, it's something we celebrate and we consider to be part of, yeah. the, of the human fabric of, of well-being. So similarly, in future, we wouldn't call this an enhancement, let's say the, the natural immunity to HIV. Uh, we would call it normal, a therapy that's part of normal human functioning. Yeah. But um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, these so not only were these the first genetically modified uh, human uh, first human genetically uh, modified uh, individuals. They also happen to be the first enhanced individuals at the same time. So it kind of st- struck two things off the checklist at the same time. And that's that's when I cover stuff like that at work. I'm like, oh my god, like yeah, this is like the kind of stuff we absolutely projected yeah. what happened years ago. And here I am writing about it, you know, and or you know any number of things. Like uh, uh, for example, a couple of months ago, uh, researchers developed a system where it was uh, translating you know brain signals uh, directly into speech. So unlike those, some of the more uh, um, clumsy systems like the late Stephen Hawking used, where he actually had to use various uh, 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 twitches and uh, gestures to uh, emit the words, this was quite literally evoking uh, signals from the auditory cortex to produce uh, synth- uh, vo- uh, speech through a, synth- a voice synthesizer. Again, kind of fantastic stuff, right? So and it goes on and on and on. So again, to answer your question, yeah, I mean, in any, I, I think maybe the transhumanist uh, urge is tempered a little bit by the slow pace of development, but there is still this inexorable pace of development. I still see things happening. Yeah, it's it's funny. I I mean, I see a lot of the you know because w- the work that I do is is sort of all of you know right beside all that stuff, right? And so I'm I'm seeing those news stories as I'm looking for the space stories, and I'm able to see all of these various developments. But a lot of the stuff that I watch, say in artificial intelligence, like my back, like my degree is in computer science, so I'm you know I can see the kinds of of developments that are happening in in artificial intelligence, machine learning, adversarial generative networks, things like that. Yeah. And it's just it's astonishing that suddenly it's- they've got these tricks. You know, this person does not exist, where you can see a computer drawing pictures of human beings that aren't real and you really got to work hard to figure out whether or not that's a real person or not a real person um or and and then other variations of that and so none of it really boggles the imagination to to say oh you can imagine it's generating full screen video at 60 frames a second it's you are uh You know, you're watching these video games play, you know, you're watching computers play Go really well, and then it plays chess really well, and then it plays Dota 2 really well, um, and which is just a, that is just a mind-bending accomplishment. And so you can kind of see all of this stuff unfolding in real time. It feels, I mean, it, it feels like a digestible to me as a, you know, as someone who is aware of watching the progress, but still, when you think about it in the in sort of the period of time, you know, as I ask Google what time it is or to get to give me detailed instructions by voice, and it does it, um, and, and and it also kind of amazes me how quickly we are just incorporating these discoveries and these accomplishments into our regular day to day life. Yeah, I have a supercomputer that is uh, on my you know, that I hold in my yes. pocket that has access to all of the stored humanity that is that has high definition video and allows me to, you know, access all of this stuff at high speed almost anywhere that I am. Next, you know, well, and from an yeah. airplane. Yeah, I mean, uh, things we've seen in the last several years that are just like, continue, like, I, I don't take any of this for granted. The, the trouble is once, once, once we are exposed to it, very soon thereafter, we take it for granted but i was just a qu- couple quick anecdotes one when those two falcon 9 rockets yeah. landed at the same time in such perfect synchronization i thought my god I've ne- this was the most science fiction thing i'd ever seen in my life it was just it was visually i mean it was just so spectacular and it was just a very humbling thing to see and uh obviously full props to uh spacex and elon musk and what they're doing there to kind of keep to pushing the envelope forward in terms of our space capacity 
But uh, back to artificial intelligence, yeah, I'm even at work, you know, uh, reporting on uh, the AlphaGo Zero system. I think it's been a couple of years now, but this was the system that uh, it wasn't. It wasn't uh, this the AlphaGo Zero di didn't. De well, it defeated the the Go champions, the the, Gro the Go grandmasters. But more importantly, it defeated the the, the supercomputer a Go system, the original Go system that defeated the grandmasters. Yeah, and it did so. It did so by self-teaching itself how to play uh, Go over a couple of days. It just played itself. It played itself, played itself. And in, in, in a couple of days, it had accumulated. I think they were saying, like, well, how old is Go? Like, Go is, like, thousands of years old, bro, right? And, like, it basically it accumulated not only all of the human knowledge, acquired human knowledge of Go in a matter of, of a few hours, it even succeed, exceeded it by an order of magnitude, such that it, demo it demolished the Go system, uh, I think, 100 games to zero. Yeah. 100 games to zero and the authors of the study the associated study this is by the way google's uh uh alpha oh, what is the name of the company maybe your listeners can uh can remind remind me i'm completely zonking out on the company that uh does the alpha go but um they um uh now uh, yeah the, the authors of the study described the, the only word that they could describe it was uh, a level it was just a level of super intelligence you know and just whenever again for for transhumanists and and futures to, to utter the word uh, super intelligence kind of sends shivers down your spine because many of us are kind of scared witless about it all, right? And uh, just to see like, oh, like we are having more and more machines operating beyond human comprehension. Oh, great. You know, <laughs> yet, another, yet another thing that we have no clue what it's doing, you know? And sure, sure it's in the friendly confines of a, board, of a classic board game. But the, the, the concern moving forward now is, again, move – as these AIs and ASIs move into domains that are important, like, you know, oh, I don't know, managing the, uh, the, the our hydroelectrical grid or uh, managing nuclear silos or strategizing the next, you know, way we attack our enemies, you know, capacity to do this or whatever, that uh, we're just, up, we're constantly going to be upping the scale of responsibility and impact uh, of what AIs do and, and where AIs can potentially go wrong. So one of the most um, pressing in, in, in quickly emerging fields in artificial intelligence right now is, is solving this problem, which is the black box problem, where you, you're, you're the computer at the end of the day spews out an output or does something, reaches a conclusion of some sort. And the developers have absolutely no way of explaining how it did that, or even to a certain degree understanding the answer. It kind of brings Douglas Adams' mm -hmm. uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy to mind, where, you know, what was it? the answer? It was 40. 42? 42, yeah. yeah and, and it was like, well, I don't know what it means, right? So then What's this the whole the series, the, the, they just kind of like go from there. So yeah. So what they're, what, there's this movement even that, look, if you're going to build an AI, if you're going to build a super powerful AI, you better bloody well be able to explain uh, how it's doing it, how it's crunching those numbers and why it came up to, came to that answer. And I, I, I think I, I'm a supporter of this. I think we absolutely should be pursuing that particular uh, line of, uh, of inquiry. But I'm also at the same time extremely dubious that uh, years from now, as AIs become even more powerful and more sophisticated, that we are these puny eight brains are just not going to be able to understand it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just these brains are only only so good. Like, or and, and even like an AI can only dumb it down so much. <laughs> it's like okay, it's like look stupid. Like this, you know, I'm trying to tell you this is how I did it. Yeah. But there's no way. There's yeah. what, what was the? Uh, yeah, there are no the, words for this in your human language. <laughs> yeah, there's a great analogy. Uh, what's it, is it? Green that did the the documentary on on string theory on M theory and everything. Yeah, what, what, yeah, the one the one on on Nova like a couple of yeah, years ago. It was really good. But he had this uh, scene in the in the documentary where he was trying to give a, a physics lesson to a dog. So the dog <laughs> the dog was just sitting there, you know, looking at the chalkboard. And the point that Green made was like, look, I'm giving the best lesson. Like, I, I, you, I can't teach this any better than I am now, but there's no, it's just, this dog just cannot, it's not, its brain is incapable of grokking the subject matter. Yeah. And I think that's an excellent analogy for maybe 10 years down the line, or even maybe today, for example. Yeah. I don't know. It, it certain depends. It'll be domain specific, right? Uh, application specific, but eventually, the computer won't be able to dumb it down. So we're gonna have to, <laughs> That's we're just gonna so have funny. To, yeah. We're just going to have to trust it yeah. when we hit the green button, go do it. Hope it won't destroy us or hope, you know, hope, you know, hope it won't get out of, you know, out of control or yeah. worst of all, you know, these kind of unintended, it's the unintended for me, it's the unintended consequences. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that, that is, that, that is not uh, something that I really want to, 
uh, I mean, we did an episode a couple of about a month and a half ago. I talked to Phil Torres, who's one of the people for the uh, oh man for the Existential Risk Council, the uh, study for existential risk, and sort of went into a bunch of this stuff and how little is being thought about the possibility, you know, just where the this stuff's all going to go. Um, and but but one of the things that I find very comforting is that that one answer to the Fermi paradox is will not be uh, robotic, you know, like the computers took over their home planets because they would send spacecraft. So the rea the fact that we don't see uh, robotic spacecraft colonizing every nook and cranny of the Milky Way tells us that that can't be the answer for the Fermi paradox. And yet that's the one that seems most likely. I would love to give people a, a chance to ask you a bunch of questions. Uh, this con comes from Arjone. Uh, is more general AI on the horizon, or will we be seeing very focused AI for the foreseeable future? It depends who you ask, right? I was at a conference in Prague in uh, late August, early September last year, and it was it was called. They, I'm sure the organizers wanted to call it the Artificial General Intelligence Conference, but they called it like the uh, Human Level Intelligence Conference, which is a bit awkward. But it's it's basically the same thing. Uh, a general intelligence, like as your uh, listener or viewer is, is very aware, I'm sure, is uh, is is very human, like in, in the sense that it's super adaptable. It can be put in any in many many different kind of contexts and, and figure what the, what the heck's going on. Uh, we don't have anything remotely like that right now. Everything's super specialized, super niche focused. It does one thing. Uh, sometimes it's superhuman level, right? Uh, whether it be like chess or go, or even a calculator, arguably is super intelligent because it's still, I guarantee you it does math better than you can do it in terms of some of the simple arithmetic. But um, so in terms of the question, when when should we expect to see it? Uh, there were people at the conference uh, that were, I think, way too optimistic when they start saying things like you know two to five years, <laughs> and, and uh, but they're, these people are at the same time trying to secure investors. Because uh, they're, they, they're working on it themselves, and this part, this part of their plat the platforms that they're working on. So of course they have to be. They have to, they have to present these kind of plausible timelines that would be of interest to you know stakeholders. Personally, uh, I think we will get there, uh, probably in our lifetime, uh, depending on how old you are. Uh, I, I would, I would again I hate, hate to do the cliche futures thing, uh, and I got hate. I always hate. The one thing I always hate about being uh, involved in this kind of futures discourse or predictions. Uh, I have more talk about what I feel is inevitable some point down the line. Uh, but if I was to be pressed at it, I'd say, you know, another quarter century, you know, 20, 25 years, maybe less. Again, the problem is understanding that whole Kurzweilian law of accelerating returns that the, that the technology starts to get faster, 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 faster. Because I'm a firm believer, for example, that uh, we will start to off progressively offload AI development to AI. Right. And I'm a firm believer that artificial superintelligence will never be invented by a team of humans. It'll be invented by a, an extremely sophisticated system that's artificially intelligent. So once you have AI developing AI, oh my God, then forget it. Then who knows? And once you have re the requisite computational yeah. you know, capacity and the resources to do it, um, and it knows what, apparently knows what it's supposed to do, then it could be relatively quickly. Yeah, so well, you I would, can I, see the, like, the developments happening section by section so now ai is you know for the longest time computers have better have been better calculators than us and and now computers are better go players than us and shortly computers are going to be better uh creators of random photographs of human beings than us and so on and so forth and so the question really is is like do you is the intelligence the general intelligence of a human being just the collection of all of these independent functions yeah. or is there something more i mean yeah. we can see that evolution was able to make meat be generally intelligent so the question is how long will it take us to turn silicon which appears to be very fast into some level of of intelligence and and it's just a you know it's a matter of however many yeah. factors of yeah. magnitude are we off right yeah, and I, I don't believe for an instant that the brain is not something that is intractable in terms of our understanding. Yeah, it's a pound of meat. You know? It's a pound of meat. It's pretty, It's the, as they said, it's the most sophisticated thing we've ever encountered in the universe. I, I love that because I believe it's true. Yeah. We, we have yet to create an actual emulation of it, not even anything remotely close. Um, but we'll get there because it exists in the real world. It's, it's, it's susceptible to all of the laws of physics and chemistry and... and uh, 
it's going to be it'll be hard, but you know, we'll, and we may come we'll hit roadblocks in terms of you know being stalled in terms of certain lines of inquiry. But eventually, I feel that we'll uh, we'll figure we'll figure this thing out and create a, and create a functional model of it, which is an artificial general intelligence. Um, interestingly, though, uh, and this this might the the, 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 the trouble and I don't know maybe the, the word trouble is is, is fair, but uh, the, the same day that we invent, so-called invent, an artificial general intelligence, though, is pretty much within the next minute we'll have an artificial super intelligence. Yeah. <laughs> by definition, the next tweak, the next iteration of it is now, by definition, art artificially super intelligent, which is now it's like beyond uh, the, the hu our human human capacity. And um, there's a line of thinking, and I'm somewhat partial to this, that once we have AGI, it'll be real quick to something uh, much more profound in terms of its capacity, uh, some kind of uh, artificial super intelligence. So we need to be uh, very careful uh, once we get, so as, as we approach AGI, put your seatbelts on a little bit, right? <laughs> maybe yeah. kind of pump the brakes a little bit uh, and maybe try to bring in everybody like, you know, Let's have, a, let's have a, a very sober conversation about what we're doing here. Well, it's possibly a little too late then. I mean, these are these are conversations, you know, this idea of the control problem that you're going to try to figure out how to make something smarter than you do things that are good for you, right? It's like ants trying to convince us that we should be taking good care of ants. I guess my wife would think that's yeah. My wife would think that's a good. That's, my my wife is a it's a insect photographer, so she would be all for that. But oh, nice. but um but you know I would love to hear their arguments. I'd love to hear their uh, as opposed to us advocating for them. So I think that's the that's the issue that we uh, that we get into. Um, all right, let me take some more some more questions from from people here. Um, uh, so A.V. Scott and Flower asks, as a futurist, do you take into consideration socioeconomic political factors into your considerations about the future? Yeah, I do. And they're not usually optimistic. Uh, and again, really? Uh, That's yeah. You're not. I it's, so it's I know, sh I'm shocked. You look at, you know, watching the news on a daily basis. How, yeah, how I know. I know. How's but, that possible? But don't you, I mean, so, by like, don't you by the, by various standards, you know, the world is getting better in every way that we can measure apart from a couple. Yeah. I'll tell you what my line of thinking is. Sure. Um, and I gave this talk at, uh, what the heck was it? I think a, 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 it was like, I think an existential risk conference at Stanford or somewhere. And but, uh, this was now maybe, this was definitely over 10 years, ten, yeah, 10 or 11 years ago. So before, before this current feeling of uncomfortability, if you will, uncomfortability. Um, so I, my concern is that we're increasingly coming into the possession of very dangerous technologies. And we're learning that can even be social media for goodness sakes. Yeah. Which who would have predicted that, but you know, um, but I'm thinking more apocalyptic scale or, you know, mega scale, uh, uh, you know, devices and weaponry and so on. And right now, as it stands, our civilization, we have one kind of arg arguably one, uh, you know, apocalyptic scale, uh, you know, device and that's a, a nuclear weaponry. But that, that's already old tech now, right? That's really old tech, what, 75 years now? Yeah. You know, so and it, interesting how in that 75 years, we haven't come up with another one, which I, I do find that interesting, but I don't necessarily, I don't, I don't for one, one second believe that that was the last, you know, apocalyptic scale uh, device that we come up with one can quickly come up with, you know, various nightmarish scenarios involving uh, nanotechnology, like self-replicating nanotechnology. Of course, artificial intelligence, we just talked about weaponized AI. Just watch watch Terminator and get have another idea of, you know, ro robotic scale, you know, Armageddon. Um, uh, even uh, through biology, through, uh, you know, the unleashing, uh, you know, uh, biological, like genetically engineered or however, uh, lab engineered pathogens and you can wipe out mass scores of, of, of people. So the trouble is not only is there the concern I have that these are going to be developed, the concern I have is, is the accessibility mm -hmm. of them and how virtually anyone will ar arguably be able to actually create this themselves. Yeah. It's kind of this twisted democratization of apocalyptic scale technologies Yeah, where the, if you look at the trajectory of, of, of human civilization, it's, it's, it used to, it was a one, a one point, you know, you, it was, at, you know, um, state level military was required to unleash a horrific amount of, you know, devastation, but over time it's becoming less and less 
in terms of that size. Now you can, now it's down to, let's say, you know, this kind of asymmetric threat. And now you're going to get down to even team level where you have 12 individuals, each one of them specialists in a certain thing. They could actually unleash a horrific amount of, even or then eventually down to maybe a couple, just even a couple of people. Or just and one even, bad person. Bad, sadly. Yeah. Yes. You know, and that scares the crap out of me. Yeah. And uh, so back to the your, your listener's question. So whenever, okay, democracy and, and liberties, love it. It's great. We're so privileged right now, depending on where you live in the world. You and I are in Canada, and we're so privileged and blessed to be in this country. But that's because we're the, the stressors around us are manageable. Uh, and and, and uh, we don't meet, there's, I mean, one can make a strong case that we should be on uh, five alarm fire right now because of global warming i would say what the hell this is crazy what's happening with global warming why but anyways i that said i'm gonna park that for just a second yeah yeah that'll be but a different episode are, where yeah. i just freak out if, about global warming for an hour right which we could yeah. easily do but let's say there are these tangible demonstrable threats that of the, of the ones that i just described unfortunately and we saw this with 9 11 where you saw a very quick withering of civil liberties in the united states you saw these laws get enacted where suddenly security, so privacy was out the window and, and, and borders became all messed up and all that sort of stuff. So as, as these stressors become more intense, more severe, more real, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to say that not only does it take away from uh, our liberties and our privacy and all that, it starts to edge away at our, our basic civil rights and it also introduces the need, or not even the need, it introduces the pining for authoritarian scale governments the strong man, mm -hmm. the quasi, uh, uh, almost quasi dictatorial, even, even borderline totalitarian mm -hmm. style governance to control the population such that it doesn't result in a kind of mass destruction. And that's the only way to prevent uh, this kind of scale of, of Armageddon being unleashed. And that's the argument that Nick Bostrom is making right now. Like I know he he just did his talk in Vancouver actually at the, uh, the new TED talk. And that's the gist of his talk is, is, I think that we're probably going to have to, the purpose of AI is we're going to have to create a totalitarian AI that's going to stop humans uh, from wiping each other out. Yeah. I, I, and I what's the alternative? Was, yeah. yeah. No, it's scary, right? Yeah. So that's why I'm very grim about uh, the, our future in terms of the political prospects. Uh, it's sad, right? You know, because I, you know, I come from this kind of this, this, uh, this community, these transhumanist borderline utopians and we talk about you know and even earlier talked about you know we're talking about kardashev twos and hedonistic imperative and eternal bliss and all that and like well that's amazing if we could if we can accomplish it if we could actually get there but oh my god like it really right now i just it's i hate to be this wet blanket on your show yeah uh, but it just really seems to be uh, the, the, the the trek to get there just seems so impossible yeah if you could deliver the button that gave everybody on earth the opportunity to release a plague that would wipe out anyone of their choosing. How many people would press that? How many times would that button get pressed? Uh, sadly, we see it on all, like you saw yeah. what happened. It, yeah, we Easter do break, see it. You know, it's, it's just, it, yeah. it's just endless. The, 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 the nihilism, uh, that that's, you know, it's just for sad. Yeah. So, so uh, I wonder I, what's the, I mean, what's the solution, right? Like on the one hand, you absolutely want to increase, I mean, again, as Canadians, we enjoy just an unprecedented amount of freedom um, here in our country. And I'm sure, yeah, two days ago, a lot of our Canadian, uh, fellow Canadians were able to appreciate uh, the level of freedom that we had. And, and yet you've got this situation where these technologies are getting, they're coming faster, they're getting, each one is potentially more and more destructive. And, and what do we do? I, I have no I good answer for you. No, I, mean, I don't know. I, one, one idea though, we, we, we definitely need to uh, lose this kind of, uh, the, the, the nationalism that's running rampant now globally and start to think more with a global mindset. And uh, no one's talking anymore about global governance and strong United Nations and these transnational organizations for uh, oversight and you know for accountability. But I think that would be a, a starting point is to just have uh, uh, just a, sh a sense of a renewed sense of global community and, uh, and, and a humanism, a restored humanism. And uh, that, that I think would be uh, a, a very uh, super modest start to uh, uh, 
I think, you know, tackling what is, what's a, what will be a, a tremendous challenge. Yeah. Uh, so what, uh, what's a recent story that you worked on that was really cool? I mean, we were all bogged down on all this uh, black hole stuff, but you had another cool story like yeah. the same week, right? Yeah, the same day that the black hole story broke, I, uh, my colleague Ryan Mandelbaum was very excellently and very expertly covering the black hole. We put out a couple posts that day. Um, I was busy working away at a at a, at a nature paper uh, in a completely different mo vein altogether, which was uh, archaeology and anthropology. So I'm sure many of uh, your uh, uh, your viewers are familiar with uh, the hobbit species that was discovered uh, about 10 years ago, or maybe 15 years ago or so, uh, on the island of Flores, and uh, they were this diminutive human. They were they were it was a Homo floresiensis, floresiensis. So they were humans, but they were like I said, a diminutive version. They were under three foot seven, and what happened to them was uh, the theory, anyways, is they were they somehow. Um, uh, became locked in, uh, in onto an island uh, where they where they stayed for many many thousands, you know, potentially tens of thousands of years, and this this uh, what's called insular dwarfism set in, which is an evolutionary process that the, that many animals are subject to, like any kind of pygmy species uh, on on these islands. And usually, and it has to do with access to resources and so on. So we learned by that discovery that even humans, uh, well, first of all. Uh, humans uh, are subject to insular dwarfism, and oh my God, there was a human species that was. Um, uh, that that was this, but now the new news that came out last week, or it was last just last week, uh, yeah. two, two weeks ago, ago. Yeah. two weeks ago, um, uh, yet another discovery elsewhere. Um, this was, um, geez, where was it now? Oh, in the Philippines, and uh, a completely different uh, group of humans again, but they they were human, and they gave them the, uh, the name. Um, it was on the island of Luzon in the Philippines, so they gave them the name Homo luzonensis. Uh, what's remarkable about, about these, these individuals, they might have been even sh uh, shorter than uh, the hobbits. They, and by the way, the time scales we're talking about was about 30, I believe, a memory serves about 30,000 years ago. So we're talking at the same time where, where humans were, our, like Homo sapien was around. Uh, so it might have been a little after the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals went extinct 40,000 years ago, and also the Denisovans, which were kind of a sister group to the Neanderthals. But anyway, but the point being is that at one given time, not too long ago, we had at least like, what, four, four or five groups of humans scattered around the planet, possibly even more that we don't even know about, which is like, to me, mind-blowing. Yeah. We were the only ones left standing. Homo sapien, that's it. Yeah. Uh, there the was rest very a multiplicity of, of Homo, but now there's just Homo sapiens. But uh, what's remarkable as well about uh, Homo... Uh, Florinesis was they exhibited some rather strange characteristics. Uh, for example, they had um, toe bones, feet bones that were oddly reminiscent of Australopithecine from Africa, which is like what? Because this is a, this is like a predecessor species to uh, Homo sapiens that are, we, as far as we know, they never left Africa, never came close to leaving Africa. So why are they? <laughs> all the way in the Philippines have this like, you should see the bone like, you do a comparison it's like whoa it looks identical right it could be though an example is called convergent right. evolution right where similar traits emerge in a separate species when it's under similar environmental pressures in this case get this the environmental pressure if you will or the push was to return to an arboreal existence in other words homo florinesis were returning to the trees right in theory they once they were Walk bipedal walkers, but they were living in this jungle island environment, and maybe just to be safer or to forage for for foods over the course of thousands thousands of years, they were became proficient uh, tree. So these bones, the bones, so let me, I missed a very important part. Yeah, these bones on the toes and even on the on the hands are wonderful for climbing, grasping, and hanging off branches and climbing trees. So that's why they think that, uh, again, it's just a theory. We don't, this yeah, is based yeah. on just a jumble of bones just, that they found. I mean, just who, who like, knows oh how God. many more uh, are, are like this? Well, George, we've reached the end of our hour. Uh, this was an awesome chat. Uh, where can people find out more about what you're working on? On a daily basis, Monday through Friday, you'll find my, uh, my scribblings at Gizmodo. And uh, that's that's the best way. And uh, I, anywhere two to three posts a day. Yep. You know, try to, try to chug out the content, but uh, we hopefully do a good job. And we're like a, me personally, uh, as you as your uh, viewers are probably getting a sense, I there's a lot that I cover. You know, I, I also love paleontology and dinosaurs and all that stuff, but certainly anthropology, archaeology, 
and I definitely hit the space beat as well, SpaceX and Russ Cosmos and Mersey and all that yep. stuff. I, 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 I'm, uh, all, I definitely I'm on top of that. Uh, I did an update today on uh, the the Chang'e four mission, which is not much to report on, but there's a little bit of you know that that yeah, they information. They released new very pictures. Slowly. Yeah, some new two pictures of the yeah. release. Yeah. Well, it's so, it's uh, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk. And it's been just wonderful to watch your whole career unfold as a uh, as a science you. and space journalist. And uh, you're doing you got you and and the rest of your team. I got to get Ryan next. I'll corner him absolutely and, and have an well, interview with him great. as well. He, you'd love him for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, but uh, thanks to everyone watching today. Uh, thanks for the donation. Uh, really appreciate that. Thanks to the moderators and the great questions. And uh, next week is, oh, man, who's going to be next week? It's a really good one, too. Um, and I even forget. Jeff Notkin, right. Meteorite man Jeff Notkin is going to be my guest next week. Uh, the also new president of the National Space Society. So it's going to be a lot of fun. He is a real treat. So definitely make sure you show up. All right. Uh, I will put some links to the show notes so people can find out more about what you're doing. George, thanks for joining us today. And uh, we will see you all uh, next week. Cheers. Bye-bye.